you wonderful scuba divers out there, welcome to Scuba Diving Magazine and welcome to Ask Mark as well, which is my scuba diving Q&A. I am Mark, obviously. Uh, I'm a former scuba diving instructor and whilst I don't teach people anymore, I do like to answer your questions on scuba diving uh, from the internet and to help you out as much as I can. So if you do have any questions, pop them down in the comments below and I'll get to them next time. If you use the Ask Mark hashtag, it will get featured in the next Q&A. Uh, but this week I'm talking about BCD lift, mapping reels, the Shearwater Terek versus the Perdix 2, the new version, um, the regulator dive mode, uh, backplates for new divers and defog solutions. So let's dive straight into the first question. Which this week comes from Mohammed Al Busaidi, who says, "Hello, Mark. It's me again. Uh, first of all, congrats on the uh, on the move. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. My question is about BCD lifts, especially hybrid BCDs, or some call it back inflated BCD. What would be the minimum lift requirement for a single 12 liter aluminium tank, two kilo back pocket weight, six kilo belt or SLS accessories like DSMB? I've seen ranges started from 24 pounds to 75 pounds. Sorry, I know there's a long question, but I would." Uh, I would like you to explain. Thank you and have a good day. Um, ooh, I haven't found a clear video so far on explanation on uh, what the minimum lift capacity. Yeah, it's it's because it's a um, a tricky concept to um, to kind of explain and and it's going to be different for each person. But it's more about offsetting your negative buoyancy, so all of your heavy stuff that makes you sink. Um, from from that like basic description, it, it's probably just a, a warm water or a relatively warm water dive, um, recreational depths. So you you really shouldn't need that much lift. I mean, recreational BCDs that are specifically designed to dive with like a single 12 liter tank. That's their real like Goldilocks, what they're like meant to do. They're going to range from like 20, 25 pounds is probably the, the, the lower end of like a recreational um, BCD to like your 45. They're your like your main headline flagship BCDs for um, for um, manufacturers and the the buoyancy can actually be proportional as well so a smaller size BCD is going to have less lift than a, um, a larger BCD and um, but it's more about the the negative buoyancy that you're bringing with you so most divers if you um, if you take off their weight belt and whatnot, they'll float on the surface and they won't be able to get down. That's why we need to carry those weights. So even with a deflated BCD, I mean, if you, if you think back to like the early days of scuba, they didn't even dive with BCDs. They just weighted themselves appropriately so that they were neutrally buoyant or as close to it. Um, so they, they didn't actually have BCDs. They're, they're not a requirement, but they do make our lives a heck of a lot safer uh, and a lot easier as well especially on the surface um so i mean my my travel wing is um is my d18 um and as the name suggests it has 18 pounds of um of lift and i'll dive a, a 12 liter aluminium or 11 point whatever it is liter aluminium cylinder um with yeah dsmb all that kind of stuff um but it's more to offset the, the the negative weight that you're um, uh, that you're using. So I'd focus more on the weight that you're carrying with you. That's six kilos and the two kilos of um, of trim on your back. Um, focus more on adjusting that instead of the amount of lift that you require. Um, so yeah, do that proper buoyancy check at the beginning. Jump in deflate your BCD all the way, get all of the air out of that and see if you can sink. If you sink readily, then you're just carrying too much lead. Um, and it's ideally best to do it at the end of the dive with an empty cylinder because cylinders adjust their buoyancy towards the end. They tend to get a bit more floaty uh, towards the end of the dive. Um, so do a proper buoyancy check. But sorry, going back to your, um, your question, uh, unless you're carrying a lot of heavy gear a lot of like technical stages and all that extra uh, extra equipment and stuff that is very negatively buoyant 
there's no real like minimum lift capacity as long as it's enough to get you to float on the surface um, that's really the the minimum so most like recreational bcds are going to be perfectly fine it's just offsetting any excess negative buoyancy so any excess lead that you're carrying down with you that's what that minimum um, sort of lift capacity is um, is sort of what you want i know it's a very I can't give you a definitive, but oh, you need this amount uh, because it's personal for everybody. But realistically, yeah, you don't actually need a BCD. You just need to um, like tailor your weight um, to, um, to allow you to get under the water, but not so much that you can't get back up. Um, ideally, you shouldn't use your BCD too much underwater unless it's to compensate for a, a wetsuit compressing. Eves Morin says, what is the best reel for mapping a site uh, 100 meters long? Um, so a so you're mapping a dive site of um, of some, depending on what you're doing it for. If you're trying to do a um, like a grid reference, then you get more like industrial stuff, like big proper spools. Um, but an actual uh, like 100 meter long line or a reel for for mapping you want to look at something like cave reels or, uh, or guide reels sometimes they call it i mean the best is going to be something like the apex i think they just call it a guide reel um that's quite gucci um it has everything from a, a rubberized handle that can uh, you can rotate it uh, depending on what's most comfortable in your hand um anodized aluminium sections to it that come in like four different colors so you can personalize it and um, and you can disassemble it to a certain degree so it's easier to clean um, nice line on it as well and um, most cave reels they're different from a, a ratchet style reel that divers use to like send up dsmbs so um, so they don't have that ratchet mechanism it's just a spool attached onto a handle and it's just free to rotate um, so you can wind it in, you can pay line out, and nothing is going to uh, to restrict it, but it will have a, um, a nut, like a grub screw, not a grub screw, uh, but a, a screw mechanism that you screw in, and that stops that, um, uh, that spool from spinning. Most cave line spools are gonna be fairly spartan. They're, they're usually just a, a, a U-shaped handle to grab hold of and that's attached onto the spool and that's kind of it. Uh, the, the Apex one, they've they've gone inspired and they've they've added extra features and made it really fancy, but then they've made it really expensive. So for the best, yeah, uh, that would be that one. It is much more comfortable and practical, um, but you can get some really like basic Spartan ones that do it. But if you're mapping like a proper grid site if you're looking for something then yeah there's proper like industrial stuff and um and plenty of uh, of line because you're going to be doing like concentric squares and whatnot um concentric that doesn't seem like the right word but whatever um but yeah if you just need a 100 meter long um reel then yeah look for a cave reel they're typically about 100 or 200 meters long sometimes they do it in feet which makes it a little bit you've got to convert it um but yeah, the, the best out there probably is going to be that Apex, but otherwise, yeah, there, there are plenty out there available. Jared Callender says, can you please compare the Terek and the Perdix 2 and highlight any different features? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so the Shearwood Terek and the new Perdix 2, um, they're, yeah, they are quite similar. I mean, I... It's almost the, the watch-sized version of the, um, of the Perdix. Take that sticky off. Um, as far as features, apart from size, uh, the obvious size difference between the two, um, the Terek has a, uh, an apnea dive mode. So if you're into your free diving uh, or even just snorkeling and you want to take your dive computer to monitor how deep or how long you've been under the water, uh, the Terek has that mode, but the Perdix does not. Perdix is just for scuba. Um, different batteries. So the Shearwater Perdix 2 has a standard AA battery. Um, they do prefer the fancier, like high voltage batteries, just because some of the features are a bit more demanding. So they need a slightly fancier, less 
bargain basement battery um, in it, whereas the uh, the Terek has a rechargeable battery built into it, and then you you put that in a little cradle to uh, to recharge it. Um, the screens. Granted, the um, the Perdix screen is a bit bigger. I think technically the uh, the AMOLED screen on the uh, on the Terek has a slightly better resolution, um, but it is not exactly hard to uh, to read the information on the uh, the Perdix. Um, the logbook, I think, is I think it's actually twice the size in the um, in the Perdix. So if you're not logging your dives and writing them down quite so frequently i mean we're talking i think this is 500 hours and this is 1000 hours um so that's a lot for you to um sort of write down or download onto your um uh, your smartphone or tablet or something so um but it is always nice to uh, to have it there um i think the depth rating is different i think the um the the perdix can go a little bit deeper than the um than the Terek. i mean the Terek can go down to 200 meters whereas the uh, the perdix is um is 260 I think it's that way around um, but deeper than I'm ever gonna go um, and otherwise the the buttons uh, the buttons the straps so the buttons the buttons on the Perdix are piezoelectric I think that's how you pronounce it um, so these don't have any moving parts to it and they they work really easy even if you've got big clunky gloves on the um the Terek has a four button compared to two button uh but these are just stainless steel like action buttons so there is something to move um so better for warmer climates you can still like find them and push them with gloves but the the purdy is going to be a little bit easier and yeah the uh, the strap option so on the Terek, it's a standard 22 mil wide strap you can swap it out for um, for like replacement straps and whatnot, but it's a traditional watch strap. Whereas the Perdix, you can have either those twin um, like fabric elastic straps, or you can use like four mil bungee to attach it. Um, but as far as features go, algorithm is on the same. I think that they're both um, Buellman ZHL 16 Cs uh, with gradient factors. Um, the, the the gas modes and whatnot on the inside are sort of much the same. They both have that wireless air integration. Um, otherwise, I think that's about it. The the main like big one is apnea. If you if you're into free diving, that really um, sort of puts you towards the uh, the Terek. Um, but otherwise, yeah, very, very similar. Uh, you've got watch functions and stuff on the uh, on the Terek that you don't have on the um, uh, on the Perdix, so if you wear it like day to day, it is a clunky watch um, compared to traditional wrist watches. But if you've got big wrists, then it's uh, it doesn't stand out too much. But as far as actual dive features, very very similar. Adam Collins says, "What happens if you forget to put your regulator in dive mode and do a full dive in pre-dive mode?" So this is um, with second stages. Um, so second stages. I think it's mainly Scuba Pro that does it. Scuba Pro um, calls their Venturi switch like dive and pre-dive. Um, this one, for example, so this is a Hollis 212 second stage. Um, so this has a Venturi switch and it's either plus or minus. Um, a, a lot of other brands it is just like on or off or plus or minus or whatever there, there's no real um i mean it is literally on or off a lot of divers they um and it was on a similar model to this because they gave it like a, a ratchety click they they thought that it was oh I, I quite like it three clicks backwards um when actually it's 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 on or off basically the venturi is just redirecting airflow on the inside of the second stage if you leave it in pre-dive mode all it does is instead of having the airflow come into the second stage and then be directed straight into the mouth it redirects it back towards the front and then it like eventually gets into your mouth there's not a lot of square footage in there for that gas to uh, to mill around but it does create a bit of turbulence and it does slightly increase your work of breathing um, so that's that's all it is most divers won't even notice it's unless you put it on like an ANSI test machine you probably won't notice um, there's 
I mean, if it, if it does increase your work of breathing to a certain degree, there is a chance that you could end up with a pulmonary edema, um, but that's incredibly rare. Um, I don't think I've heard of it. And, um, but yeah, if you can remember just to switch it to, uh, to dive. Basically, if it's in your mouth, switch it to dive mode. Um, if it comes out of your mouth, switch it to pre-dive mode or on so that that second stage doesn't free flow that and that's basically it um but it's it's not going to be the the end of the world if you uh, if you forget to and um, most divers yeah won't even notice Ashish Sakar says, hi Mark, thanks for another great video, you're welcome. Um, would you suggest a backplate and wing over jacket style BCD for new advanced divers? Um, so would I recommend new divers invest in like a backplate and a wing instead of like a recreational BCD? Yeah, uh, there are actually dive centers out there nowadays that train brand new like open water students on backplate and wing because they're, they're just much more customizable. Now, recreational BCDs are fine, um, but they're made to do single cylinder diving and that's kind of it. There are different specialities. So you get the lightweight ones, you get tough ones, you get some with different things and all the extra stuff. But with a, a backplate and a harness, you, you can very easily customize it and have a uh, literal custom made BCD for you, for your requirements. If you need specific D rings or specific pockets or things, you can add and remove things. If you, um, if you're an odd shape, then you can you literally build that harness that fits you more comfortably. If you want to dive on singles and then one weekend you're diving on twins then you can swap that bladder out and then you're diving with twins so they're much more customizable um so yeah if you feel like you're getting into your diving and it's really gonna take off and you're gonna run with it then yeah back plates is definitely worth at least looking at because if you do end up getting into like real serious scuba diving and doing it long term then yeah it's much more practical for you a lot of divers when they when they see like back plates and they, they're like a, a sheet of metal on my back surely that's uncomfortable but no uh, i dive this just with a rash vest and if you bear in mind that your this is on your back so you're underneath it and your body is like hanging down if you're wearing a weight belt or if you're wearing a, a wetsuit then you're floating up into it then there's no like metal bearing down on you it's only if you um when you get out of the water that you kind of notice it but it's not uncomfortable and it, it doesn't um like dig in anywhere and a lot of the new styles of back plates are much more ergonomic compared to um, previous generations um but yeah yeah I, i'd recommend at least looking into it um, because it is a bit more of a um, an investment. There are quite a few BCDs nowadays. You get like Mars XR, you get X Deep that are, they come fully assembled. All you have to do is just adjust them for your size and then add any extra things to them. So it's less intimidating as buying like all the separate bits and then having to make it yourself. Um, so that makes your life a lot easier. But yeah, if you're just starting out, instead of buying a, a recreational BCD, that's going to, you're effectively going to grow out of it. Um, if you progress, then yeah, definitely worth looking into uh, into back plates and wings. And finally, Alexander says, Hi Mark, in my last dive, I didn't have any anti-fog spray, so I read on the internet that I can use baby shampoo instead. On the dive, after about 20 minutes or so, it started to make a lot of bubbles in my mask and to blow the mask out didn't help. I felt not really comfortable with this, but I didn't want to end the dive because I just that possibility to do that one dive in this awesome spot. What would you recommend to do in such a situation? Should I stop the dive at this point or should I try to enjoy it next time? Okay, so first of all, yes, you can use baby shampoo, um, diluted. Um, I've tried it neat and even though it was no more tears, it does hurt your eyes. Um, so I usually water it down with um, water. Um, quite a fair amount. You only need um, a small amount of baby shampoo in a decent amount of water, um, turn it into a solution, and then that's quite a good defog um, solution. And um, yeah, on the inside of your mask, and then give it a wash, 
So, um, so you're getting, because you only need a teeny tiny little film of it to, uh, to get in the little crevices inside of your, um, uh, in the glass. And, um, and that's a very good defog gel. Um, go for the dive. And if you do find like foam coming on the inside of your mask, uh, then you're going to like wind the clocks back and, uh, and remember back to uh, open water dive four, where you're going to do a full mask removal and replacement. Um, so instead of just a full flood and clear, it's, it's better if you can like actually give it a scrub with, um, with your fingers. So I tell you, buddy, just can, can you watch me? Um, I'm going to do a, a mask removal just so your buoyancy doesn't like disappear. Uh, cause a lot of divers, as soon as they lose that, like visual reference um, and they're like holding their breath or something that their buoyancy can go so it's worth your buddy at least watching you so they can grab hold of you and stop you from floating off or sinking down um, yeah break the top seal flood it take it off give it a scrub on the inside to get any excess off and then put it back on make sure all the hair is out from underneath the seal uh, give it a good um, sort of clear and, uh, and continue the dive. Otherwise, yeah, backup masks are always quite useful. Um, I always dive with a backup mask. I had one where um, I was trying out a new mask and I hadn't prepared it quite enough. So I'm just continually fogging up and you try and clear it, you get salt water, uh, and it just gets annoying. So it got to the point where I just swapped it for my trusty backup mask. Um, but yeah, it's usually a, a matter of mask off, clean put it back on and that's it for another week uh, wonderful questions as always everybody well done uh, again if you have any interesting questions by all means pop them down in the comments below and if you want me to discuss it on one of the uh, the next shows use that hashtag ask mark either at the beginning or the end or in the middle it doesn't really matter as long as it's there uh, YouTube just like puts it to one side for me to find it um, but yeah remember to head over to scuba diver our website for all the latest news and events and all that kind of stuff as well as gear reviews and things you can also head over to Diver Net, uh, that's our other website. Again, that's a bit more scuba diver news kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, head over to the website. There will be a link that's popped up in the uh, in the right hand corner. Thanks for watching, everybody, and of course, safe diving.